This podcast is supported by Wesleyan Financial Services, providers of specialist financial advice to members of the legal profession. Wesleyan's team of dedicated experts have been helping law firms and their employees achieve financial well-being over many years, providing personal and commercial financial advice, in-firm seminars and online guidance. Strategic partners with the Law Society, Wesleyan is proud of its partnership with Women in the Law UK. For more information about Wesleyan, visit wesleyan.co.uk or to arrange a financial education event in your firm or a no-obligation financial health check, connect with Sarah Deacon, Wesleyan Area Manager on LinkedIn. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Talking Law with me, Sally Penny MBE. I work as a barrister at Kenworthy's Chambers in Manchester and I'm also the Joint Vice Chair of the Association of Women Barristers and the founder of Women in the Law UK, which aims to inspire the next generation of lawyers. Please do come and find out more about what we do. We're on Instagram at Women in the Law UK or online at womeninthelawuk.com. Today you'll hear my conversation and interview with Professor Felicity Gerry QC. Felicity is a high-profile legal expert with extensive court experience in various areas such as terrorism, homicide trials and sexual offending. Her work has led to changes in the law on modern slavery, FGM and reproductive rights. An international QC working in both England and Australia I tease Felicity that she was a real hotshot. Hi, oh, Sally. Yes, yeah, very funny. Recently, a friend of mine said my office in um, my chambers in Melbourne looks like I'm in suits. So I feel <laughs> hotshot fits with that um, image that I'm not entirely sure is me, but what fun. No, it is. It is. Now, you are so highly achieving. I don't know where to start. You've got a master's, of course, you're queen counsel. You've been admitted to um, work in the International Criminal Courts and the Specialist Chambers in The Hague. Uh, you know, your, your achievement is so amazing. I really want to start from the beginning and ask you, why did you come into law? Well, um, I originally I studied law because I thought it was a pathway into journalism. And uh, I thought that's what I would like to be. But I didn't really have any links to journalism. And once I started studying law, I absolutely loved it. I suppose the real story is that I always thought I was going to be an actress, but I could only ever play the Wicked Witch of the West. So I don't know, I get, I get to dress up in black robes, go to court for an argument and the intellectual stimulation that comes with the law. So, you know, it's not a very exciting answer, but I... I fell into it by accident and loved it. And what, and why crime or you know international human rights is what we say now on public law, but 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 really it's criminal law. Uh, but you started in general common law, didn't you? Um, I did. Why did you choose that? Well, uh, um, oh, partly that was because I wrote seventy-seven applications for pupillage and only got twelve replies because I didn't go to. I assume because I didn't go to the right school or whatever, but. Um, Again, at university, I absolutely loved international law and conflict of laws and the injustices that come in criminal law, which include human rights abuses, particularly on the international stage. So I think that was something I always wanted to do. But at the beginning, I just had to get that pupillage, that elusive pupillage. And I wrote 77 handwritten letters in ink pen with oh my um, specific to each set of chambers and uh, 12 replies, I think six interviews, and I took the first one that was offered. That was the advice. If you get an offer, take it. Um, so I started in a small chambers in Leicester that had a very good reputation, still does, New Street Chambers, and had the brilliant opportunity to have a go at everything, family law, uh, civil and commercial crime, both prosecuting and defending in crime, I didn't pursue family law, partly because I thought at the time a lot of women were targeted for family law cases. Yes. And also be because um, I think people had an identifiable enemy. There were some terrible breakdowns in relationships, whereas 
in a criminal case, it's the state against the individual or the police against the individual, I suppose. So there's less of that personal dynamic. And I could also speak to very vulnerable people. I'm pretty good at chatting to people wherever they're from. So crime was the way to go. Absolutely. Now, I always ask everyone this because I'm really interested. I wonder if you can share with me um, some significant cases that changed your life. If you had those, I'm sure you're going to have more. Yeah, I have. Trying to um, change the law, which is what I like to do, or improve or reform the law or correct errors of law means that you do have quite interesting cases. But the three, I think, that affected my life the most are uh, very early on in my career, I was prosecuting what you used to be labelled a prostitute rape, so a rape of a sex worker. And I was laughed at in the robing room. Oh, 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 prostitute rape, you'll never get that home. I thought, you watch me. You know, it doesn't matter what someone does for a living. They're still entitled to effective participation in legal proceedings, particularly women who are subjected to that sort of abuse. Anyway, she was a wonderful witness and there was supporting evidence and I did get it home. And I thought, you know, I know I don't always fit into this profession, but I'm pleased that I don't in these circumstances. So I can take these cases that make a difference. And um, from a defence perspective, as well as a prosecution perspective. So I was involved in a, in a death penalty case in Indonesia where we managed to get a temporary reprieve from execution from a woman on death row who'd raised her status as a trafficked person. Her name's Mary Jane Veloso, and she's still on death row, but she's still alive. And that was an amazing case to get involved in because my research on human trafficking was relevant to a particular case. And the situation for women on death row around the world is horrendous. So my contribution to that not just that case, but to understanding that trafficked persons are on death row across the world. Um, it was a really important and defining moment for me, but also a really important and defining moment for the research and the push to combat human trafficking around the world. And then, of course, the case that everyone knows me for, which is Jogi, yes. which was correcting an error of law that had gone on for at least 30 years. Um and which has had a spin-off effect. I think I've now done uh, 12 or 13 cases on complicity in six jurisdictions. And uh, in New Zealand, they bought me a hat that said Felicity on complicity. So, um, <laughs> and to read, in that case, 500 years of law and to understand how the law went wrong, why it went wrong, why it absolutely needed to uh, change and the injustices that those errors caused. Of course, as um, I've never been the same again, you know, those terrible miscarriages of justice that are still going on. Those people are still in prison who were affected by those terrible and deliberate errors of law. So yes, it's life changing to do these great big cases that have the potential for changing other people's lives as well. Absolutely. Now, listen, we know, um, that case because we're at the bar um, and I've been in the bar for 20 years but I've acquired some non-lawyers who listen to uh, me on this podcast all 26,000 of them can you just give us a brief summary um, perhaps in your words about uh, Joshi and the complicity laws and how, how you change them just so people understand really the significance for them yeah, um, look, it's the law, it's really called the law of complicity, but it's known as joint enterprise. And it's where the law extends liability. So um, the principal offender stabs someone, and this is what happened in Jogi. The question is, was Mr. Jogi complicit in that stabbing? So um, the problem was that the law had developed in such a way to reduce the elements of the offence to make it easier to prosecute people for being allegedly complicit in other people's crimes. So very quickly, liability, the proper law is that you are you can be liable um, for a common purpose. So if you all agree and plan to kill, uh, depending on what role you play, you can still all be prosecuted for, and convicted for that and get a sentence. So the yes. example I usually give is the Italian job, the movie. Yeah. Mr. Bridge is in prison, but he's the organiser of the whole thing. Um, so he is equally complicit in the gold bullion robbery that takes place in Italy. You can also be complicit as an accessory. So someone else commits an offence, but you assist or encourage. And 
uh, in all of those circumstances, you have to know the essential facts of the crime that's going to be committed, whether it's planned or whether it's by somebody else. You have to know the essentials of what you're effectively being complicit in. And then you have to do acts which demonstrate an intention as a principal offender in murder, that is to kill or cause really serious harm, or an intention to assist or encourage that crime. So that's the proper law. But unfortunately, what the courts did, firstly in the Privy Council and then deliberately in a case called Powell and English in the UK House of Lords, as it then was, was that they said, well, look, we'll extend liability outside of that common purpose, the idea that you're doing something together. But if you embark on one crime, let's say a burglary, and you foresee the possibility that the people you're with might do another crime, then you're equally guilty of that other crime, which is a total nonsense. If you think about it, if you're, let's say, a rugby player and you go out on a Friday night and you can foresee the possibility that one of your mates might get involved in a fight, how on earth are you equally complicit in that fight? And sadly, it was a very deliberate decision. It may have started as an error, but it was what they call a policy decision to give this a try and it went horribly wrong and people have been convicted when they're not present, when they hardly do anything, when they have absolutely no intention to kill or cause really serious harm or to assist or encourage, it it significantly affects the young, particularly black youth, particularly vulnerable youth. I've got one client with autism. Uh, It was a terrible, terrible way for the courts to go. And fortunately, the UK Supreme Court was brave enough to at least get rid of that extension to common purpose. There are still problems and they made a terrible decision to try and block future appeals, which I find remarkable, that the House, the Supreme Court would sort of create a barrier for future cases that they didn't even have before them and hadn't even had arguments about. So there are still policy decisions being made that I don't agree with, but at least to get rid of that terrible form of liability that became known as as parasitic accessorial liability was progress. Yes. And we go back to that proper law where you've got to prove that people are intending um, to be complicit in the crime that everybody knows the essential facts of. And that seems to me enables a safe outcome uh, subject to other problems that there still are in that in the area of law of complicity and the way in which cases are prosecuted. So I hope that's a simple way of explaining it. Complicity is very complex. But, yes, yes. It's you know, very- that essentially the easiest way of understanding the case of Jogi and the easiest way to understand that there are still about a thousand people in prison who were affected by that error of law, who are still stuck there and subject to that injustice, which I feel very strongly about. Yes, well, I think that com- that comes across, to be fair. Um, <laughs> thank you for explaining it rather than me, because I, I, you know, I would probably have stated the statute on joint enterprise. I-, I want to move on a bit, if I may, Felicity, and ask you about your practice in Australia, New Zealand, and The Hague, and really in internationally um, how did that come about and indeed how does that work to be you know living in Australia then coming back to England because you're here now thankfully I've caught you because you're here <laughs> yes yeah. I am here now um look I, I always wanted to work internationally but I had children so go working in an international criminal court has really only just become available to me because my children are now 18 and 21 and getting there is is a process. You can't just assume that you can do it. I mean, some men do, of course. They get the brief regardless of any experience. But I think it's really important to engage in international law, engage in the research and the publications, and really understand what international criminal law in particular is about. So getting to The Hague is about being sufficiently proficient in in that area of law. But um, working internationally came as an opportunity via my husband, who was offered a job in Australia for a year. So that was a wonderful thing for us all to do as a family. Let's go to Australia for a year, which in fact turned into eight. And I've had wonderful experiences at the bar, firstly in Darwin, in the Northern Territory, which is tropical, 
Yes. Um, and now in Melbourne, which is very cosmopolitan and has all the art and culture that I, um, I enjoy. So in terms of travel, it's very easy. You get on a plane and travel. You have to be organised about your diary. You have to have good clerks. Um, and, you, you know, we've always done it. The English bar's always done it. Have brief, will travel. Um, so, look, it, I travel slightly further than other people, but I enjoy it. And I've had, I think, having the opportunity as well to contribute to the development of law in more than one Commonwealth country has been really fulfilling um, and and useful in terms of developing my practice. So um, I'm not about to give it up anytime soon. Absolutely. Well, on that note, then, at the two countries, what do you think about diversity in Australia versus a United Kingdom, uh, if you like? Uh, well, is it better? I've like not to... done the research, but funnily enough, I was talking to um, a young woman that I'm mentoring through the Australian New Zealand Society of International Law at the moment. She's a Muslim lawyer, and we're, we're chatting about the equitable briefing policies that there are in both England and Wales and Australia. And there seem to be differences in those policies and equality and diversity policies seem to be different, whichever chambers websites you look at. So we were actually talking about this this morning and worrying about how many rules there are around equitable briefing and how few rules there are around not being inequitable, about um, racism and sexism you know, and somehow in order to achieve equitable briefing, we've created all these rules and guidelines that somehow make it, uh, I don't know whether it makes it more difficult or not. So I think uh, there's some more work to be done on how you can compare the legal, the two legal professions. But ultimately, my experience is this, and I've said this before, that it seems to me that the legal profession is the Jurassic Park of gender equality, and it still is. Uh, <laughs> that it clearly is structurally and culturally not geared up for women. That's women as accused, women as witnesses, and women as jurists. And we are mostly visible as victims, or um, including in the legal profession, you know, or, or, or to be protected in some way. So. I'm so, I'm pretty furious about that. And the way I've dealt with it over the years is to sort of kick as many doors open as I can. And I suppose getting on the lists of the International Criminal Court and the Kosovo Specialist Chambers has been part of that. If I can be seen there, if yes. I can be seen defending in terrorism trials, if I can be seen prosecuting and defending in complicated trials that um, are not traditionally seen as women's cases, then that kicks the door open for me and other people and, and hopefully makes a difference. But at the same time, on the list at the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, I think it's 17% women. So we've got an enormously long way to go, even though most graduates are women. Yes. So, I, it, you know, I've got a bit of a bad temper. I think it makes me cross that there is a culture that sees it as not necessarily normal to have someone like me there or someone of colour there. And yes. I don't want to be a judge at, at the moment. I'm not sure I ever will be. So I'm glad there are more women judges. But um, there's something about the culture that I've felt constantly needed to be challenged. And I unconsciously perhaps did that at the beginning by even applying yes. to all of those chambers. And then again, by keeping my accent. I didn't pretend to be anybody else. Mm. Um, so, and I discovered in much later in life that was a little bit Indian and somehow I thought, well, I unconsciously did that too, <laughs> but I consciously thought, well, don't tell me I can't do that. Yeah. Yes, I can. But I do find that I have to perhaps prove it more than a man. And I'm not sure there's a perhaps about that. Somehow I have to have the masters. I'm doing my PhD, the letters and silk, the yes. cases, the publications, somehow I have to do all of that where some other man will just step into the brief because he's got good marketing in chambers or somebody says he's a nice bloke on the legal 500. And that infuriates me too. But you can't argue with what I've done, you know, that yeah. I have, I can show you where I've written about 
complicity in international law. I can show you where I've researched defending human trafficking victims who commit crime. I can show you evidence that I know what I'm talking about, which other barristers don't. And I hope that's welcome to the public who want me to represent them. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I genuinely hope that it's an inspiration for people younger than me and that they have it easier than me, with or without children, wherever they come from, whatever school they went to, whatever university they went to, whether they got AAA stars or struggled in their first year at university, you know, the, the bar is a place that can accommodate difference and eccentricity. And I would love it to be full of people like well, me and you, frankly. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I'm a black woman. But but I just wanted to ask you, do you think, therefore, merit somehow women to be judged as meritors for the positions we hold in the, in the bar and indeed in the law? We've got to do more because you're right about the letters. You know, um, we, we had a young woman who's just starting in her career mistaken for being a defendant in the court because she was black. There was no other reason for it. We haven't really moved on, have we? We're trying our best. And I just wonder, do you think, where does that pressure come from? That actually, when we're good, we've still got to be even better. Is that society or is that just a profession? Oh, look, I think it's a bit of both. But I think the profession is basically set up as a cricket match between blokes, you know, to have a little match in court and chat about the sport and the football. So I do think there is a whole cultural problem. I love Alexandra Wilson, fellow Essex girl. Yeah. Go her. She's <laughs> fabulous. And I hope that the fact that I'm an Essex-born barrister, Queen's Council, inspires her to keep going when it's so difficult um, for particularly the things that she's had to experience. Yeah. Um, and I do think in society we do have to go the extra mile, particularly when we're engaging in professions that are traditionally seen as male. Um, but I will say it's better than it was. I don't yeah. necessarily agree with you on, 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 you know, it's no better. I do see more socially diverse and um ethnically and culturally diverse people when I go to court. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that when I started, it was almost as though no women had any children. There was never any conversation in the robing room about children. It was remarkable to see me pregnant. I can remember people thinking I wouldn't be there somehow if I was pregnant. And I was determined to keep going, even though I was enormous. And I had to go to court in flip-flops which they call thongs in Australia I bought black <laughs> ones but I was so enormously when I was pregnant with my daughter I couldn't get my shoes on as I still went to court and I and it was sort of uncomfortable for men to see this hugely pregnant woman and I didn't care you know what difference does it make doesn't make a difference to my brain or my ability as a barrister so but people before me almost had to pretend they didn't have children. There were no conversations. There might be men talking about which private school their son was in, yes. but that was about it. So I think my generation, uh, of course, came after that generation that had to play it in a different way. And yes. I've been allowed to, well, no, I've made sure that I'm very, very visible as a woman. I've put my lipstick on. I've had glasses over time. I've had little bits of red in. I've, I, I don't know. I've been myself, yes, which is a little bit showy, and I can't help the way I am, and I've embraced it. And I had some very good advice earlier on, early on in my career from, a, uh, from James Hunt, who became a high court judge, who had a huge personality. And I said, well, what do I do? You know, how do you manage? And he said, look, no great circus ever crept into town, which I love. And I thought, yes, OK, be yourself is what he meant. And in my room in Chambers in Melbourne, I now have lots of circus related things. And some of my juniors call it visiting the circus. And I think if that helps break down another barrier for people to be comfortable uh, with you know, a noisy woman in a profession who's trying to break down some barriers, then I hope that helps for future generations. And I'm delighted to see uh, people like you, yourself and Alexandra really challenging the world through books and podcasts yeah. and saying, look, here we are. We've been here 25 years. I'm a new barrister. And, and great, you know, if I've contributed to that only a little bit, it's wonderful. And I'll perhaps end on this because this is what I commonly say is 
before I came to the bar, I used to teach children to ride horses. Mm. And I think that's how I got quite good at communicating with vulnerable people and children because you have to communicate very quickly to a child on a naughty pony to make yes. sure they don't fall off. Quick, simple, uh, to make sure they don't have an accident. But also, I was once beaten in the show jumping by someone I taught to ride. Wow. And everybody says, you know, oh, you know, that must have been really embarrassing. And I say, I stay, say every time, no, it absolutely the opposite. For me, it's still one of my best days because I taught her to ride and she went on to beat me. That was fabulous. I want to see everyone come after me and, you know, do all the new jogies and all of those cases. I've done another recent case on manslaughter called Rebello that sorted out the law on autonomy. I'm really proud of all those things, but I'd be even more proud of the people coming up after me to carry on that baton um, and to make the law, um, reform the law, uh, contribute to the law, understand the history of law and develop it into a, a, a profession and a, a, a framework and a rule of law that accommodates gender diversity, race and culture diversity and really understands the society that we live in now, which I think is is so, so important. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I don't teach people to ride horses anymore, but if my little contribution is read uh, use your talents, be yourself and contribute to the, the legal framework of society, then, um, you know, I know it can sound a bit trite, but I, I love that that's what I do. I enjoy the law and I enjoy mixing with people of all um, experience and eccentricities and wonder, all the wonderful diversity that we can have uh, now that the vast majority of graduates are women. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, I want to ask you about your well-being. I've still got a couple of questions left. What do you do with all this jetting around and high-profile <laughs> high cases? Because well-being in the bar is not great. We all work too long. We ruin holidays. Uh, you know, the burnout rate is high. So I just wondered, what do you do or what would you like to do? I think upcycling is going to be the answer to your question today. Uh, I, I think sometimes I'd say I eat cake too much. Uh, I eat too much. I'm not particularly healthy physically. I can't be doing with boot camps and exercise. I read a lot and I'm on my computer a lot, so I'm not particularly healthy and well that way. But, of course, I love what I do, so I'm always relatively happy. And I have a fabulously supportive family whom I love and love me. So that's really important that you have support and people that you can talk to when it is really tough. But at the moment, I'm enjoying upcycling furniture. And I, we've had a saying in our family, and I've sort of gone by this saying since I was, I don't know, about 12 when my parents divorced. And I only had a certain amount of money and I had to buy vintage clothes and secondhand things. And <laughs> I, it, it's always been secondhand first. If you can get it secondhand, then you should get it secondhand. And only after that do you buy something new. And I've lived by that rule all my life since then and now. And my husband's very creative. And together we upcycle furniture. Wow. So that's what we do. Um, and it's fun. And I love it. I'm the designer. My son fetches it wherever I can find it. And my husband creates my design so something completely different I think is my yes. advice for well-being yeah. do something else plenty of fresh air and do something else fantastic now I always I'm very keen to ask about books and fictional characters and I know because you love reading <laughs> this is another one isn't it we were going to have like a top 10 list by yeah I know I'm sorry I rattle uh, on no it's all right <laughs> but um, I, I'm just I just you know I'm guessing that that's going to be the case so have you got some favorite books that you can share with us um and what they're about we've got a book club you see so we're always very keen for new books yeah so I, I knew you'd ask me this and it's really <laughs> hard because because I have favourite books that I go back to and read, poetry that I go back to and read, and uh, and some are classics and some are modern, and, and a lot of Australian literature. I've introduced myself to a lot of Australian literature. But So what I thought I'd do is just give you my current hmm. favourite audio books. Fantastic. I don't always sleep. You know what the bar's like. We're yeah. awake at all hours of the night, and I find if I'm 
struggling with sleep. I put on an audio book. Some of them I have to listen to 10 times because I've fallen asleep and I don't know what's happened. That's me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and some of them you have to stay awake for because they're a bit fierce and you don't yeah. want to have a bad dream. But um, the three at the moment that I picked for you are these. Uh, the first is a book called The Elements of Eloquence by Mark Forsyth, which is really about the rules of rhetoric, the figures of rhetoric, which is really about the art of persuasion, which is what we do as advocates at the bar. But I discovered through a bit of reading, short version, that we no longer, we're not taught the figures of rhetoric anymore in school, but there is a bit of research that shows that the end to teaching the figures of rhetoric in school came about at about the point that women were allowed to be educated at a senior level and they didn't think that women would understand rhetoric, so, so it sort of fell into misuse. Now, I don't know if that's entirely correct. It's one piece of research, but it really annoyed me that I was never taught the figures of rhetoric and this book explains how Shakespeare used it and how Shakespeare would use portions of other books but turn them into Shakespeare's language and that it is a way of learning how to be persuasive. And you can never stop learning. So I'm loving learning the figures of rhetoric, which I was never taught. Brilliant. Um, and your other two? The other two, um, well, look, there's loads of Australian fiction. I struggle to choose between Too Much Lip, which is about an Aboriginal family, but in the end, I went to, for the one that's most associated with me, which is The Dressmaker by Rosalie Ham, uh, which is really captures sort of the Victorian experience. I mean, Victoria in the sense of the state within Australia. Um, so The Dressmaker, played by Kate Winslet in the movie, great audio book to listen to. And finally, I picked this one, but um, which is The History of English Food by Clarissa Dixon Wright. And people will remember her at the bar. She was amazing, yeah. dressed up in a suit to get into Grey's Inn before women were ever allowed in. And, of course, I nearly didn't get called to the bar because I went to Middle Temple in trousers. Um, I suppose I'd call her an another fat lady lawyer. So I love her and I love listening to her. And I thought she was wonderful. So she's on my favourite audio books and I've got a lot of them going on, but they're my three favourites. Fantastic. And what about a favourite fictional lawyer? And then I've got two two questions only left. Oh, OK. So, uh, again, tough question. In the end, I went for Eugene Rayburn, who was a character in a Dickens book called Our Mutual Friend. And he's a lazy, privileged, <laughs> very annoying uh, barrister who uh, is exactly what we I certainly saw when I first came to the bar a lot of lazy very privileged men uh, but he learns through the course of the book that there's something worth fighting for largely because Bradley Headstone hits him over the head and nearly kills him so I can think of a few men at the bar who could do with a bang on the head that's not that I'm inciting anyone to be violent but I think that he was who sprung to mind you know I think Eugene Rayburn had to learn that there was something worth fighting for and if if privileged people can learn that at the bar, then I think that would be a wonderful move for the profession. Fantastic. So I want to ask you now about COVID-19. It's affecting oh, okay. us all yeah, globally. Uh, and I just wondered what, how you think that's going to affect, you know, the bar and the legal profession. I appreciate, you know, solicitors, barristers, article class, oh, article class, what they were called, but, um, paralegals, silex, you know, and Australia, of course, is, is, is facing the same thing. So I just thought, what are your views on how COVID's going to affect the profession or change it? Well, I, that's a very long conversation we could probably have a whole podcast about. But I think the yes. one that really bothers me at the moment is there's already a gender pay gap. We already earn less. And as a, a female silk, there's not so many female silks, I think in the in Victoria in Australia, I'm one of about eight in, seven or eight in crime at all out of 3,000 barristers. And, it, and the, fig, the percentage is not very different in, in England and Wales. And when you already have a pay gap and you can't go to work because of lockdown, it's the women I'm worried for. Yeah. Um, and that really troubles me, that there, there really needs to be support for women at all stages of the legal profession, whether it's Silex or the, or Queen's Council, that, that 
all ought to be what we're tackling already. Equitable briefing, so important to make sure that women get the briefs. Yes. That women are in the cases, in the strategic litigation within the law firms, that they're encouraged to uh, become partners, that there are positive steps taken to ensure that women are at senior levels and that they're earning in the same way as men. So I, I think that's what really, really troubles me, that, that lockdown and a pandemic will add to the barriers that we have as women, as lawyers. And obviously, I've kept going by being a keyboard warrior and doing all the things that I find important. Um, but I have a sneaking suspicion that men have had more briefs than we have during during lockdown. And, and I think that's a real problem. Yes. And so just on that, thank you. And I wholly, wholly agree with you because I, I see it now. And, you know, running a women's organisation, women contact me all the time and men who have got care and responsibilities. Um, the question that I want to end with is really about retention and advice to young lawyers entering the profession. The retention, I suppose, for for established lawyers. But what advice would you give for young lawyers entering and advice on retention yeah look i give this advice quite a lot so it sounds a bit formulaic and i apologize for that but i think it's the best advice i can give in my experience and i teach at a university as well as being at the bar so i'd say to my students all the time look i i learned this late but have a sort of five-year strategic plan and the way to do that is just decide what is your dream job you might have five dream jobs but what i what is it what would you really like to do and then go online find that dream job or those dream jobs and write your cv now as if you're going to apply for it now you'll have gaps but you'll have some skills that you haven't really thought about the example i've given today is being able to speak to children that would be a useful skill that you could put on your cv for a job where you want to involve yourself in cases involving children and but then when you identify what those gaps are you can fill them mm. i like working with the un but i didn't have a masters and if you apply to work for the un there's a box that you tick have you got a masters and if you can't tick that box you have to say have you got professional equivalents well, I do, but why should I have to justify myself? Tick, got myself a master's when I was 50. And I should have got one when I was younger, but I didn't have that opportunity. So, wow. Yeah, you know, I was really proud of myself. When the um, vice chancellor said, oh, I've never graduated Queen's Council before, and I said, oh, no, I'm 50. Um, <laughs> so, I was, yeah, I was really proud of myself. Anyway, look, have a five-year plan, see where you get to, then have another one. I want. I worked locally in Leicester, then nationally in London, and now I work internationally. And I look at what do I need to do to get there. Now, okay, I may have to prove myself more than a man and have a few more badges, but nonetheless, I think a strategic plan is the best that you can do. And build in some breaks, build in some holidays, read, write, contribute, don't lose sight of what you're passionate about. It is your dream contribution to the law. There's a range of things you can do to contribute to the law. You don't have to do what I do. Make sure you've got support, but all important plan. There's no reason why you can't do it. You're, you're bright, you're well-educated, you're all wonderful people. Don't lose sight of your dreams. Find your dreams on the internet, which I couldn't do when I was young, and, sit, and get yourself skilled up in order to achieve that dream or those dreams. And your dreams may change over the next 15, 20 years of your career. If your dreams change, doesn't mean you, you don't, you're not strategic about it. Think about what you need to do to get there. Dreams can change in all sorts of wonderful ways. Uh, but if you're working out where you want to go, don't let anyone else dictate that to you. Not clerks, not senior members of chambers, not the bar cap, no one. It's your career. Um, even inside a law firm with very strict arrangements, if that's where you're working, identify your dream job, go to the senior management, get people to get involved in those dreams, work out who you need to get there, create your networks and go for it. And you will lose. You will get knocks along the way. You know, you might need another piece of cake to keep going. Um, <laughs> but at least try and you'll feel good if you try and there are plenty of people here to support you 
when you find them. They may not be the immediate people. And I keep in touch with people from all over the world, from all different places who I use as my, my support and encouragement. Fantastic. Felicity, Gary, QC, I think I need to have you back on. There's so many areas. <laughs> honestly, we need like a three hour session we need to cover. Uh, but this has been a good, a good um, taster for what's to come. Thank you very much. Well, I'd be delighted to come back anytime you like on any topic. And um, look, I've loved it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you again for listening to Talking Law with me, Sally Penny. You can find me on Twitter at SallyPenny1. Thanks so much for taking the time to leave us a review and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks to Wesleyan Financial Services for supporting this episode and thanks also to Sam Walker and our production team at What Goes On Media. If you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to buy Talking Law 2, the book with all proceeds going to charity. Bye for now.